Ani bojo. Debwe in Dishnikaz. Ashkigman and Dochaba. Makwa dodem. Ajibwe in Nishnabe Misaga in Dao. My English name is Mike Ormsby. My family's from Curve Lake First Nation. And I'm going to share some stories and some writings that I've done in the past. Ghost Canoe, a poem about the passing of Tom Thompson. Paint it using a mixture of regular marine gray and an artist's two dollar tube of cobalt blue. There was little chance of mistaking Tom Thompson's distinctive dove gray canoe. Yet when it was found floating upside down in Canoe Lake, offshore and unattended, riding free in the wave's wake, little could anyone have realized the great mystery about to unfold, the legend and the lure of the man, the story that might never ever be told. Discovering Thompson's body bobbing near little Wampanoag Island with a bruise over the temple, blood coming from the ear, could this be the result of an argument that got out of hand? At the very least, finding Tom such had been the greatest fear. With so much talent and surely a prosperous future just ahead, it was sad that by July 1917, at age 39, Tom Thompson was dead. But would anybody ever know how he had met this terrible fate? Over the years, memories fade and facts become less than straight. What is to be made of the ankle wrapped around with fishing line? Was Tom killed by a waterborne whirlwind or likewise divine? And whatever became of the missing favorite paddle, so much that is hard to fathom or begin to try to straddle? What of the two paddles lashed inside the canoe as if ready to carry, but apparently haphazardly tied with less than an expert's knot? Had Thompson decided to head out west to leave without further tarry? Was a loan to Shannon Fraser involved, a debt for canoes recently bought? Were harsh words over the war with Germany allowed to inflame? Was Martin Bletcher the one that was to blame? Would the truth ever come out of what had happened to the artist come guide? Had he drowned standing up, attempting to pee over the canoe's side? Was it a case of possible foul play or even suicide? Had Tom Thompson gone missing due to a matter of family pride? Had he promised Winnie Trainer that they would wed? Or was his death the result of a fatal blow to the head? Was there a baby that was soon to be due? And who really last saw Tom in his canoe? What is to be made of the report of the artist's frequent swings and mood? Was Thompson a gentleman, true in his word, or a drunkard, sometimes crude? Was he happy or sad? Was he bipolar or even depressed? So much remains unknown and never properly addressed. The coroner arrived after Tom had been embalmed and already buried, holding a brief inquest that found death to have been accidental drowning. When to some such a finding seemed to be at the very least, somewhat hurried. Even the coroner's report, becoming lost, can only leave one frowning. What of the bruise on the temple? Was it on the left or the right? Surely there must be, have been talk from the locals of a possible fight. Accidental drowning may have been the official word, but this just seems far too simple and even absurd. Most thought Tom was more than adequate in the water. It was known he could swim. He was also considered a good enough paddle to keep any canoe reasonably trim. The water in his lungs? So long for the body to surface? Did something prevent it to rise? Too many questions for such a quick report. Too much unanswered to just surmise. What of the questions of the actual burial site? Is Tom in Leith? Or at Canoe Lake? Was there really a body in that sealed metal casket, or merely sand meant to fake? Why has the family never allowed exhumation? Was Undertaker Churchill sly as a fox, who was dug up in 1956 
Thompson or someone of native descent left in the same box? Why did Miss Trainer continue to place flowers on a supposedly empty grave, baffling and puzzling to say the least, enough to make even some rant and rave? Whatever we may know about Tom Thompson's demise, and no matter what we may have to just simply surmise, canoes do weave in and out of Thompson's story. He often painted from a canoe. Canoes appeared in his art, even that of his distinctive chestnut painted gray-blue. A canoe was involved in his death and in the name of the lake where he lost his life. Maybe from a debt over the purchase of canoes, money he needed to take a wife. Some even say a ghostly figure can be seen on misty mornings paddling a canoe in Canoe Lake. But supposedly, a silent, even benign spirit, hardly scary enough to keep one up nights wide awake. So through much of the tale of Tom Thompson is the image, ghostly or not, of the canoe. But what became of his beloved chestnut with metal stripped down the keel and gray-blue? Little is known where it ended up, maybe rotting at Mowat Lodge or on a portage trail. Years after Tom's death, a local camp even tried to locate this canoe, but alas to no avail. Paint it using a mixture of regular marine gray and an artist's $2 tube of cobalt blue. There was little chance of mistaking Tom Thompson's distinctive dove gray canoe. Yet when it was found floating upside down in Canoe Lake, offshore and unattended, riding free in the wave's wake, little could anyone have realized the great mystery about to unfold, the legend and the lure of the man, the story that might never be told. Canoe Journey Easing a canoe from its resting place on the shore, silently launching into the still water of a cool morning, the first stroke of the paddle gracefully slicing through the liquid surface, you and the canoe forming almost a ghostly figure in the early morning mist rising above the rocks, trees, and water. The sound of the water makes as it drips off the end of the paddle, yet nearly all is complete, quiet, and silence. As stealth-like as an owl on wing, you travel along the shore, the rhythm of the strokes as one with the rhythm of Mother Nature. You become one with your surroundings. As you glide across a watery wonderland, a beaver slaps its tail as a warning of your presence. The morning stillness is interrupted by the call of a loon as the day awakens. A red squirrel scolds you from an overhead pine branch. A moose munches on aquatic vegetative delicacies in a quiet, secluded bay. The morning mist, now long melted away in the glow of the sun, you easily send your canoe forward with each stroke, now and then feathering your paddle to rest, and take in all that abounds along the lake, peace and serenity, the exhilaration of being out on the water. But there is much going on along these shores. Turtles basking in the sunlight slide off a log as you approach. Slow-paced, almost statue-like, great blue heron stocks dinner. Or is it lunch? But still, you lose track of time as you drift along, forgetting cares and woes, finding strength in each paddle stroke. As you near the far shore's portage, you feel fresh, ready to carry the canoe over the short yet rocky trail into the next small but distant lake, perhaps even to a welcoming campsite under the pines, settling down for the night under sparkling stars, maybe even catching a glimpse of a shooting star or the northern lights. The cedar and canvas canoe rolls up onto your shoulders, not too much weight, a bit more than you remember from last year, just enough to let you know you're still alive. You double the carry over so you don't overdo it, or maybe it's just to take more time to see where you're at. As you rest by a waterfall beside the path, you reflect on the day, 
on what lies ahead, still a few hours left before the sun sets. Should be a full moon tonight. Maybe you'll hear the howl of a wolf, the echo of a loon from a nearby lake. You feel good, at ease, at home, and far from being alone. The canoe and you have journeyed far, and still have farther yet to go. For each trip takes you away from the daily grind. With each paddle stroke, there is definitely a greater peace of mind. So you pick up your pack, walking the last of the portage. Upon arrival, you launch the canoe into the, onto the shining waters. You and the canoe dance on into the remaining daylight. In the early morning light, just as the world seems to wake up and come alive, the canoe glides over the glass-like lake. The beautiful wood canvas hull easily slices through the lake surface, water slipping aside almost as if willed, forming undulating wavelets in its wake. Above the ripples, the paddle hovers momentarily like a dragonfly before dipping down to break the intricate pattern formed. The canoeist seems lost in the moment. On the wing, over the watery expanse, an eagle soars in synchronicity with the man's journey. As the paddler shifts to miss a rock, the raptor slows to test the wind. The large bird lazily wheels across the horizon, almost touching the rays of the rising sun, yet his flight seems to keep pace with the canoe below. The eagle rides the air currents, while the canoe dances over those of the lake's surface. As the paddle flashes in the early morning sunlight, dipping once again into the water, the eagle dives to capture his breakfast, a silvery trout. Then, only briefly, do both break the mirror, reflecting their seemingly choreographed display. While they never quite meet except for that, it doesn't stop the dance. One on the water, the other in the air. They are partners, each moving rhythmically, over a northern vista of rocks and trees and water. Occasionally, such magical moments happen out on the water. For the canoeist, the lakes and rivers become more than mere passageways. Waterways become vantage points to observe all that is around, carrying a message of life while still being the very lifeblood of Mother Earth herself. All at once, the paddler is both vessel and prophet, both audience and actor, just by merely venturing out on the water. Paddling these liquid highways takes the canoeist and canoe on a wonderful magical mystery tour, blending into the surrounding natural world. The paddler is blessed to be able to join in the dance around him for a while. While he watched, the large prey flew off, likely to share his meal of fresh fish with his young brood nesting in a nearby lofty pine. Eventually, the canoe glides on. A new dance may soon begin again. Titled, A canoe is a very good way to get close to nature. While it is possible to make a canoe go pretty fast, it is the thrill of slowing down that appeals to most canoes. Even when canoes do go fast, when they rocket rapidly through whitewater, they are still canoes, still close to nature and its environs. It is not the canoe that provides the power, it is the water. The canoe rides the water and its occupants humbly steer. In a canoe, you can't help but feel the body of the country. Notice the shape of islands or hills. Hear the cries of birds and the sound of the wind yet still respond to the hundreds of small things that make up the world around you. Take a canoe onto a lake at night and enjoy what it can do, acting as a launching pad to distant worlds, opening up a vista of stars in the sky. The canoe seems to float up to these very stars and faraway planets as the night sky becomes one with the dark silent waters Twinkling stars reflect in the murky depths until water and sky all seem to blend together in one great expanse. Canoes can sneak up on loons or beavers or herons 
even a mighty moose, silently getting you closer than you can imagine. The canoe becomes part of its surroundings, becoming part of the natural world, and so completely that even once discovered, it doesn't seem to scare any of these creatures. The canoe is just part of their world, except it is always being there. It might be that the canoe has been such a familiar sight for so long, for so many years in the North Country. In no particular hurry, the loon or the beavers slump quietly under the water, if at all bothered by any such intrusion. Usually the moose will just stand there, holding its ground patiently, outweighing the canoe and its paddlers, unless it tires and lumbers off to the safety of the nearby bush. The heron takes flight with its dignity intact, probably thinking, it's only a canoe, but I'll just move away a bit anyway. Wigwas Jimon From the birch tree comes the bark, from the spruce plant roots, from the cedar, the ribs, planking, and gunnels, and from a variety of natural sources, the ceiling pitch. A typical birch bark canoe consists of selected high grade birch bark, over 35 hand slit cedar ribs, 50 wafer thin cedar sheathing, full length gunnels, and peg caps, deck ends, birch thwarts, about 500 feet of spruce root lacing, and two quarts of spruce gum slash bare fat waterproofing. Depending on the materials used, a 14 foot canoe can take between 30 and 50 hours to complete. This time commitment requires dedication. A birch bark canoe is inherently beautiful. The canoe connects us not only to past cultures, but reminds us of the importance of nature in our lives, balance, harmony, and grace. So called reconciliation is not just a buzzword, not just a flavor of the month or the year. Reconciliation is not just about saying one is sorry or that one can forgive. It requires more than just words. It is about taking action. Maybe it should be called reconciliation. It is not up to indigenous Canadians to figure out how to make reconciliation work. Time and time again, indigenous Canadians have gone to the non-natives. Now it is time for non-natives to come to indigenous peoples. It's time. The conversation is needed now, but on indigenous terms. Don't expect indigenous people to, quote, get over it, or even jump up and down when their traditional territories are finally acknowledged in the schools. It's about time. It's about time, actually. Reconciliation should be tied to the land that indigenous peoples are connected to. This is a time for a climate change of a different matter, a change in the climate of thought, of approach, of behavior, and maybe now is the time, as we are now in a new climate of change. We need to refloat or right the canoe that is Canada, especially as we work towards reconciliation. This is both hope and challenge for all of us. What we strive towards as a real possibility for a shared future. To remind Canadians that we're all in the same canoe and then to make this country work, we should all be paddling together. Will truth bring reconciliation? Just as Murray Sinclair says, not without education. The TRC recommends the history of residential schools be added to all educational material so that future generations know the story. Justice Murray Sinclair said, but in, an, but in addition to that, the way that schools treat indigenous history also needs to be reevaluated and rethought and recast. Yes, the beginning of history for Canadians students generally begins with the arrival of Europeans. There's no history taught about the period before 1492, and that's crazy because there's a whole rich history there 
that we should be talking about, says Justice Sinclair. We have all been taught to believe in Aboriginal inferiority and European superiority, and that's wrong, says Justice Murray Sinclair.